earlier going to talk about uh, the work I did with Al Jackson on how to build a, a gravitational radiator. But we publish that work in JBIS now, so I decided to do more avant-garde and imaginary stuff. Just following our long acquaintance with Friedman Dyson, whose quotation you see here, uh, he always emphasized uh, what you could see rather than what you thought was possible or plausible to be built. And uh, we're sort of halfway in between on that because although the things I'll show you have big budgets, that doesn't mean that uh, it's big for some kind of interstellar civilization. Um, so that's the opening uh, excuse, if you will. And now we can move on to the next slide. Someone controls that, right. I just want to talk about radiators in general. Um, uh, the obvious place where Jim and I have done a lot of work is beacons, but there are all kinds of other radiators that big enough we could see at a great interstellar distance. Um, particularly what uh, we focused on generally was beamed transmission and beamed energies used for interplanetary, at least, missions. Um, that means uh, that you could scale up the beams until they become very, very luminous for brief times while they accelerated light spaceships, such as uh, sails. Um, there are, and under, under beacons here and under photons generally, uh, waste heat from starships or from Dyson spheres, things like that are, are well plausible because waste heat uh, will be common in any high energy use society. And below that are neutrinos, which are extremely hard to detect, but there's no crazy reason why somebody couldn't make neutrino radiators that carried messages. Uh, since the biggest uh, neutrino group in the world is at my institution, uh, University of California at Irvine, I thought of this as at least possible sometime. Um, and then there are gravitons, which Al and I worked on, and you can look at that paper if you like. Um, uh, it requires very small but quite massive black holes. And so the case we worked out was a black hole with the mass of the Earth, which is only a couple of millimeters in size. Next slide. Um, and here's uh, observable starships. So wh what will they radiate in? Well, probably, I wrote a whole short story about this called bow shock. Um, a very fast starship would generate a lot of cyclotron radiation in the bow shock. Our Earth's bow shock does, after all. Uh, not the Earth's, I meant the whole solar system. Um, but it could also generate a visible plume, for example. Uh, I think it's unlikely they generate really high energy stuff like neutrinos or gamma rays, but I just put it in because there, there's a spectrum and it's very hard to anticipate the real constraints on a truly energetic society and what they would radiate from their machinery. Next slide. Beaming stations. So my brother has talked a lot about this, even in fact at these prior meetings. So I'm not gonna go over this except to show that you can, you can get very high energy density in a beam. And when it is illuminating, say a, a light sail, uh, uh, such as laser beam or microwave, then uh, inevitably there's going to be some of the flux missing the, si the ship because uh, beams broaden as they go out. So you can see momentary emissions from these beams, perhaps across interstellar distances. Uh, and indeed there are a number of people who've looked at this for things uh, such as the wow event. Maybe that was a beam from further in toward the center of the galaxy that momentarily illuminated us and will not do so again because the configuration doesn't repeat easily. Next slide. Uh, this is from my brother. Uh, uh, and, and it just shows you what kind of power you could expect of beam sources. Down toward the bottom, there's, if you wanted to launch a low Earth orbit, here's, you would need a gigawatt beam. Orbit raising more so interplanetary voyages like sending sail ships to Mars and so on are still higher, but pentawatt. Um, and, and then beyond that is interstellar, which is hundreds of pentawatts. So you see, it is a big budget issue, but an interplanetary civilization probably has the budget. That's the ultimate argue. If we keep expanding technologically, we're going to be able to afford this stuff. So maybe someone else in the galaxy has already afforded it. 
and uh, all you have to do is look for it. Next. Uh, oh, yes, here's a... <laughs> Uh, what if there was a starship headed toward us? We would see it as a bright forward feature. And here, here are the representative numbers. You can, uh, you can uh, get this these uh, PDF of this slide, by the way, from the guys running the, the, the meeting, I believe. Um, and so you could have uh, this be in the range of 25 to 20, so 10 to the 25 or 26 watts, enormous luminosity, uh, focused on us because they're coming to us. So if you see the right thing in the night sky, it means you've got a visitor coming uh, and he's got a very big budget. Next slide. Uh, large beacons. Oh, uh, uh, I'll, I'll point out that some people have said you could columnate beams by using the inverse focal point. That is, you could radiate uh, a beam that was focused better using a gravitational uh, thing like, like the, the sun. And these are pictures of hypothetical Dyson spheres. Dyson, Dyson never thought these were going to be big structures. He thought they would be floating platforms capturing the radiation from the, the sun and using it to live on. He never thought it would be a real sphere. And he was rather dismayed when people started naming him Dyson spheres that he had been misunderstood. He said, it's too late to correct that. So I just gave up. Next. Uh, yes, here's a <laughs> gravitational uh, focusing by a black hole uh, really can be run to send someone a beam uh, on a caustic if you know what you're doing. So let's put it this way. If you have small black holes, you can use it for many such purposes just because they're uniquely capable of dealing things to their, doing things to their nearby environment. Next. Right, gravitational lensing constellation. Uh, th this is how to use a gravitational lens uh, and have a bunch of radiators or, or receivers around it and pick it up with a dispersed field of small telescopes. Uh, of course, people have talked about using that on the solar focus of the spot to look at different distant solar systems. Next. Um, here's more on that, a neutrino beacon, which Al has worked out, but I am not a big fan of it because I know how hard it is to do even detect neutrinos. So this could be a very big thing with a large budget, but it, um, uh, it imagines that other people are particle physicists really interested in neutrino, neutrinos by other people, I mean other aliens. And so the people running the detector would have to be very, very uh focus toward getting a message if they're going to make sense out of it because the number of neutrinos to really detect it so far is very small. In fact, the group at UCI almost missed <laughs> detecting the supernova of 1987 because it was shut, it was to be shut down only a week after the event <laughs> for some maintenance. So they were close enough to missing it entirely, which is I think is very instructive. Thank you. Um, Next slide, black home bomb beacon. And, and it, this is Al Jackson's forte. He got his PhD in gravitational work at the uh, University of Texas. It's using the super radiant radiance by harvesting energy uh, out of black holes and then radiating in a beam. It's a very rather complicated thing. And it's, it's trying to get a terawatt out of a black hole system by using black hole energy. Gee whiz, indeed. Next. Oh, and this is the our uh, from our, our paper about gravitational waves. We would we would think you'd have a a rotating black hole and a Jovian mass of, of say Jovian mass, uh, and you would use this gravitational engine to get the energy to drive the uh, the radiators that are on further out orbits. And therefore, you would have a whole semi-solar system radiating uh, using the energy gotten out of a black hole in orbit around the central star. Uh, another huge concept. Next, ah, my favorite. This is uh, actually from a novel I wrote with Larry Niven called The Bowl of Heaven, the first of three novels. And it has many paintings in three novels like this by Don Davis. This is 
an enormous contraption called the bowl of heaven by its inhabitants, not us, aliens, which focuses the energy of a star into a jet, which goes through that central hole, the knot hole. It does so by reflecting sunlight from those uh, inner shells there on the spot on the star. The whole thing is managed by truly advanced uh, intelligences, including those, that, by the way, that are actually smart plasmas that manage the jet. I thought of this idea when I was talking to Larry Niven and we decided, oh, what the hell, let's write a novel about it. It turned out to be three novels with more ideas in it. All of them about what, how big a structure could you possibly build given the limits of uh, the physical universe as we understand them. Next, conclusions. Starships will be hard to see, yes, always. Uh, for one thing, they're intermittent. Um, you can use augmenters such as black holes to up your radiated power. You can also, of course, ask the astronomers to be aware of anomalous events, such again as the, uh, the wow signal, which might have been a beamer, but it's never come back. Oh, by the way, and in the detection of the wow signal, they didn't have a single a signal processor. So all they do, all, uh, all they did was record the received power. There was no data analysis if there was a message in this thing. Anybody building a beamer to, for say interplanetary transport would almost certainly think, well, why don't I just put a signal on it just in case somebody listens to it? Um, a super radi radiance is a reference to general relativity. And if you're really advanced, you might be able to use that um, and make, make gravitational waves. If you got transversible wormholes, uh, wow, there's all kinds of stuff you can do it. Then there are planetary engineering, such as I showed you about the bowl of heaven, which is not a Dyson sphere, but rather more of a mechanical contrivance to move the entire solar system around the galaxy. Therefore, it's going on a tour of the galaxy. And necessarily, all of these ideas assume that civilizations will be planning to be around for a long time. So they'll have the time to build the systems and then benefit from them. That's the thing we haven't discussed. It's hard to imagine human civilizations where our maximum lifespan is maybe something like 100 or 200 um, would, would invest a lot of money unless their generation was going to get a payoff. You see that again and again. The only large organized structures, um, social structures we built that last over say a millennium are typically religions. Um, so there we go. Uh, we will have to, to think I th about civilizations that plan on very far longer timescales than we do. And therefore, we're dealing with a completely different kind of society, one that we have not managed to become, but might in the long run. There are powerful biological arguments that what's called antagonistic pleiotropy, which means the competing short-term goals of genes have bad payoffs as you get older. That's actually what our aging is. Aging is the failure to repair properly. When you're 15 years old, you're essentially immortal. You can fix almost anything except, say, a traffic accident. So we're talking about a kind of society we have, must realize that we have never had. These mega engineers will be in long-lasting institutions that might want to carry out interstellar discourse because they'll still be around when the message comes back after centuries or even millennia of return time. We should always keep that in mind. The goals of such a long life civilization will not be those we have ever seen before. And that could be a good thing, could be maybe a bad thing, I don't know. Uh, there's, uh, there's always the chance that elder civilizations would like to find young civilizations like ours and wipe them out because it's competition. But we don't know that, of course. I'm just thinking about our own earlier social structures in which warfare is a constant uh, multiplier in human societies and the conquest and governance and all that stuff is uh, not, I think, what you would see in truly long-term civilizations because it's too destructive. So that's a, an in social note. If you're going to think big, you have to have also must think long, longer than humanity ever has. Thank you. That's my conclusion.
Okay, questions, I guess? Yes, we have one. How would a gravitational wave transmitter be able to encode useful information in principle rather than repeating a pattern dictated only from the orbital mechanics? Uh, you'd have to enhance the orbits in telling ways uh, to implant a signal on it. That's absolutely right. We decided not to try to deal with that because the, even imagining and calculating this stuff in general relativity is hard enough. But yes, it, to, first you would send out something like a beacon, a simple repeating pattern that might interest scientists. And then you could follow it with a whole bunch of encoded uh, jiggles and jags in the orbits themselves, which would put, impose a pattern on the radiated signal. These signals, by the way, for that black hole system of uh, about an Earth mass or so are in the gigahertz range, far away from what our gravitational wave detectors can do, which is really only in the range of kilohertz. So you see it's way up in the frequency range and would not be seen by any devices that we have now. Thank you. I've got one. Uh, Dr. Benford, your, your, your first point on the slide that's showing is that uh, starships, uh, well, there's the reverse of that. They'll be hard to see unless they're coming at you. you. You mentioned if they are coming at us, it's going to be incredibly bright. Yes. Um, but if they're moving at relativistic speeds, they're not that much slower than the light we're seeing. How, how long would we see one if it was coming towards us before it was here? Well, I, I thought about this. The thing is, it's I think extremely hard to make starships that will be moving at 0.9 C or, or, or so, maybe 0.1, 0.2, something like that. And so it will be a long time. It would hang there in the sky beaming at us uh, and getting brighter as they approach. So that too is something like a, a, century long, a century long duration for the approach of a starship. I would think for plausible starships. Some people who think of going 0.99c, like Carl Sagan in his earlier paper about that back in the 60s, uh, are really making up a craft I, I think it's essentially impossible to build just because of the stresses and strains. As we saw, for example, in uh, the work that's been done on the Bassard Ram Scoop, very hard to make them above 0.1c because the stresses are already huge and the whole thing would go to pieces. Fair enough. Any more questions? With that, Dr. Benford, thanks very much for appearing remotely. Thank and uh, thanks for being our bookend with your brother for the, uh, the plenary sure. sessions. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't make it, but I would have liked to. We just announced the uh, 2023 yes. the IRG conference will be in Montreal. So we hope yeah, you can join us like there. Fun. Right.